What's up, people? It's time to hear from Jill England. She's an osteosarcoma survivor, public speaker, amputee, cancer advocate, and thriver, amongst a bunch more. She runs her community, The Best of Cancer. With us, she shares her story and imparts knowledge on how to make the best of a tough situation. So tune in. Five and a half years ago, I was shot multiple times, and I uh, was diagnosed with a spinal cord injury. Well, at that moment, I didn't know how drastic my life was about to change. And it didn't change for the worse, but it changed for the better. Actually, I was talking with my palliative care doctor today, and she, she turned around to me and she looked at me and she was like, do you think that if you keep on doing all these like things that we don't expect you to be able to complete, that you'll eventually be beat this? And I was blown away by a doctor asking me that question. And I was sort of like, actually, yeah, that's probably what I'm trying to do. Well, I know what my body's going to do to me. I've got a wheelchair in my future. But you know what I've been looking for? What's that? One with off-road wheels. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing will ever take away the pain of my daughter not being here. She will be 18 next month. Um, and it still feels like maybe five years ago, two years ago that she died. It's that's my reality. So if you can go back to that day, February 18, 1990, and change what happened, my my honest answer is I, I wouldn't change it because I wouldn't. If I didn't get hurt that day, you know, I wouldn't be in front of that school. I wouldn't be in front of the schools in the upcoming weeks, or I wouldn't be talking with you, or I wouldn't be at Children's Hospital on staff there. This was just my journey, and it, it's given me an opportunity to have a, a profound impact on a lot of people inspire and change lives. You can expect a life to kick you in the teeth and knock you on the floor, but you always get back up no matter what, and you just keep going. Living Adaptive with Scott Davidson, a podcast about learning to live adaptively. What's up, everyone? This is Living Adaptive, and I am Scott Davidson. Just a heads up before we get rolling, check out livingadaptive.com for all things Living Adaptive, and this includes previous episodes, writings, links to social media accounts, show notes, and all that other good stuff. Also, I've been talking about this for a while, Coming to My Senses, a documentary about Aaron Baker, who was paralyzed in a motocross wreck released. In this documentary, we watch as Aaron crosses a 29-mile tract of Death Valley, unsupported on foot, defying all expectations and really symbolizing his recovery. Coming to my senses is available for purchase on iTunes and Amazon, so go get it. Today we have Jill England, uh, best of cancer. Jill England is a osteosarcoma survivor. She's a pediatric cancer fighter, a public speaker and advocate involved in various charitable organizations. What's up, Jill? Thanks for coming on. Hi, Scott. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. So I was just promoting Aaron Baker's documentary. Have you heard of uh, Aaron? I know you're also sort of in the adaptive athlete realm. I don't know if you, you've heard of him. Yes, I follow him on Instagram, and he's great. Yeah, he's pretty intense, breaking bar- a lot of barriers. He uh, he was on here before, and he told me something like one in a million chance of movement below his neck. So um, I've been promoting his stuff in the core center where he operates his uh, business out of, and which is more like training recovery center. After something sig- significant happens, he'll start posting someone's recovery process and what they're doing there. It's pretty cool. But you're involved in a bunch of things, too, mostly cancer-related. And so you have your yeah. community, Best of Cancer. Um, before we get in, get going into that, what got you in so active in this realm to start best, best of Cancer, to put it all out there like that? Well, I think what really got me started was the fact that when I went through cancer treatment as a child over 25 years ago, there really weren't many outlets for outreach. I didn't have a lot of resources, social media, the internet wasn't even around yet. And with social media becoming so relevant in our world, I thought, what a great way to be able to connect with people, not just in my state or my country, but around the world. And I've been amazed at the amount of people that I've been able to connect with and take a lot from their stories. And they take a lot from my story and the community that it creates. I just, I love it. Speaking of your story, what kind of cancer did you have and at what age did you discover? Well, my story with cancer really started in 1991. I was a healthy, active, fun-loving nine-year-old girl, 
and just your average Nebraska girl. And I started having leg pain in my right leg off and on for a few months, and it would go away pretty quickly. So my parents and I didn't think much about it. But we were about two weeks into the summer after my third grade year, and the leg pain came back. I was limping around the bases at a softball game that I was playing in. And my parents thought, that is really odd. You know, what nine-year-old wild little girl limps around the baseball field? And so they assumed it was something really minor, like growing pains or a cold muscle, because I was such an energetic kid. But they scheduled me with an orthopedic doctor. And just to make sure, they wanted to check in on it. And he looked at my leg. He thought everything looked good. He checked my reflexes and said, maybe I'd need some physical therapy. I probably pulled a muscle and wanted to take an x-ray just to rule out some bad things that it could be. And turns out that x-ray showed a tumor on my distal femur, which is the bone right behind my knee. And, you know, my parents instantly seeing that x-ray, they knew a black spot on an x-ray is not good. And so they instantly knew our lives were going to be changing. But I was nine years old. I had no idea. You know, I didn't realize how much that black spot on an x-ray would change the trajectory of my life from that moment on. And it was that day I was fitted for an immobilizer to stiffen that right leg so I didn't bend it or risk breaking it and spreading the cancer. So I had to be very careful about that. They taught me how to use crutches that day. So I really never walked normally with two legs after that diagnosis. Within that first week after my diagnosis, I was in surgery for a biopsy to see what kind of tumor we were looking at. They placed a port, which was where I received all of my IV chemotherapy and a lot of my blood draws. And I started my first round of chemotherapy within a week of that diagnosis. So it really was a whirlwind for my entire family, not just me, but life as we knew it had changed and we just had to hold on for dear life sometimes. Did you know at your age how significant your cancer was? Did you know? Did did it really impact you enough to understand you were so young? Early on, I had no idea how much this was going to impact me. I was really you're a typical naive nine-year-old and... I luckily I had a lot of faith and confidence and not only my parents, but in my doctor and my nurses, I had a great team around me that even though I didn't early on understand how long of a process this was going to be or how much it was going to change my life, I had a team that I believed in and I trusted. So I followed their lead. You know, anything they recommended, I thought, okay, that's what I need to do. My main objective was to get back to the normal life that I loved, you know, summertime was my favorite time of year. So to be stuck in the hospital with surgeries and x-rays and, you know, stuck inside a building with no windows day after day was really hard knowing your friends and your sisters are outside playing and swimming. Um, So that was my goal was to not just dwell on the fact that I was missing that this summer, but what do I need to do to get through this so that next summer, I'm out there with them. That's a good attitude. I I actually remember something you wrote 26 years ago. You wrote this 26 years ago this Mm -hmm. morning. I remember holding my 101 Dalmatian stuffed animal named Lucky in a pre-op room at the hospital. I was nine years old, about to undergo a groundbreaking 12-hour surgery to amputate my leg and remove my tumor. Um, That had to have been freaking tremendous um, in terms of like the impact on you, understanding that you were going to have your leg removed at such a young age. Um, Mm -hmm. do you remember those periods? I do remember that. And I, it was at that point, halfway through my treatment, when my amputation was scheduled, that at that point I did fully understand that I was going to be losing my leg. I understood that I very well could lose my life. And, you know, most nine-year-olds don't have to have that revelation, but I understood it. And I always said that the day of my surgery was the best day of my life because I woke up alive and without cancer. And the day before my surgery, I had this tumor in there that was affecting everything that I could do. And getting that cancer out of my body and putting myself back together again was my main objective. So I really tried not to focus on what I was losing and it being my leg. I was focusing on what can I gain by getting that disease out of my body. 
totally. And you were a make a wish kid, right? At one point I was, yes. Is, how did, I, during, how did they establish that? I think a nurse or a doctor recommended me to make a wish and make a wish is a wonderful organization. All they really do is they have to get doctor's clearance that you truly have a life threatening illness and you qualify. So it's not just cancer kids. It's kids that could have any life threatening illness and they give you a wish. And it was a really awesome experience because it was a break in my day to day medical world where I'm getting stuck with needles and feeling sick. And all of a sudden someone comes to you like a genie in a bottle and says, if you could pick one thing that you want to do or something you want, where you want to go, what would you do? And it just gave me something so fun to think about. What and did you do? also to know I went to Disney world. Nice. So that's very like, unique. <laughs> yeah. No, that's my, one of my favorite places growing up too. Uh, yeah, yeah, I totally it understand was, that. It was you know, that's, that's what yeah, separates they, world from like land. I know I'm not getting in a debate or anything like this, but like world has make a wish going on and give kids the world. There's a lot of charities going on and it's actually a really cool experience to see that going down. I've had the opportunity plenty of times to see that experience play out in that realm mm -hmm. and it's, it's pretty special. Yeah. Make a wish is, is awesome. And they pull all the, pull out all the stops for these kids. I mean, it's top notch all the way. And they have volunteers that are have such great hearts. And I can't say enough good things about that group. Yeah, that's tremendous. I know that you speak to, I know you write for them uh, or you have written for them for your local chapter and you speak. Mm -hmm. What I, I, Before I jump back to your story, it just, the first question mm -hmm. that pops in my head is when you're speaking to make a wish children, children that are now nominated and accepted, what do you tell them? What do you tell them? What do you tell their families? You know, I think the most important thing when I'm approaching a child who's in the middle of their cancer battle is just to show up and show them that after 27 years, hey, I'm still here and I may walk with a prosthesis, but I'm normal and I'm living a happy, healthy life and that they won't have to spend their whole life in the hospital, that they have something to look forward to. And I hope to offer them that sense of hope that it can get better and that life goes on after cancer. You obviously encounter a, a ton of difficult stories in that realm. Some of them mm -hmm. may not get better. Um, I do. Mm -hmm. I ha I knew some, I interviewed somebody with osteosarcoma and unfortunately he did pass um, around mm -hmm. Christmas time. You do encounter those stories. How do you weather those stories? Oh, I've had many decades to think about that. And, you know, for me, when I was going through treatment, I didn't know for a long time if I was going to make it. And then after treatment, you wonder, can I get to that five year point where my survival rate goes up? And the one thing it boils down to for me is that I knew cancer would never win because I would not let it get the best of me. In turn, I was going to make the best of cancer. Whether I lived or I died, that was my mission. And if it was on my deathbed that I still made the best of it, then cancer did not win. You know, I, I, that reminds me of uh, another thing you wrote about. Um, it really hits home what you're saying. And, and I think this brings a perspective of adversity sometimes brings opportunity. And you mm -hmm. wrote, tonight after tucking my boys into bed and saying our prayers, my oldest turned to me and said, mom, I'm glad you had cancer. Why is that? I asked him, because now you know how to help people. And I thought that was really cool. That That's a really good perspective on it. Uh, a, a, a way to turn something that was so difficult into a positive. Um, what other organizations are you involved with besides Make-A-Wish? I'm also involved with Cure Search organization for pediatric cancer. They raise both awareness, funding, and support for families that are facing pediatric cancer. So I have done public speaking for them. They have an annual golf outing in Naples, Florida, the shark shootout, which Greg Norman is a big contributor to. So I traveled to Naples a couple years ago and spoke at their welcoming dinner for that event. This year, they also have a walk they have walks all over the country, Cure Search does. So I'd encourage anyone to see where their nearest Cure Search walk is and see if you could participate to help raise funding for these kids and for research. 
Um, I also am going to be doing some guest blogging for them in the month of September this year, which is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. So I'm really excited to do that. That is great. And I do know of uh, Cure Search, really cool organization to be involved in. Now, I want to jump back to you, back to your um, childhood. So you have a surgery. Your surgery isn't um, a normal surgery. It's a uh, rotation plasty. Can you explain what that is and how difficult that was? Rotation plasty is a really unique surgery. And 25 years ago, it was even more rare more and more kids have it now, but it, and it's still unique. But what, ro- what makes rotation plasty different is that it allows kids an ability to be more active and get back to their normal life faster and better. So how the surgery works is the tumor for most of kids with rotation plasty, their cancer is around the knee area. So that knee joint has to go. But if you think about the operation of a knee joint and an ankle joint, they both work like a hinge. So what rotation plasty does is they do a high thigh amputation. So you're above the tumor. And then they do a below the knee amputation below the tumor. They take the middle section of your leg out, which is the knee area, because that's cancer and surrounding tissue. They take the lower half of the leg, they rotate it 180 degrees, and they reattach it to the top high thigh amputated area. And they don't sever nerves. They're able to work around that. So we don't have phantom limb pain, which can be a big problem for amputees. And they end up operating it where if I point my toe, because my foot, my backwards foot now serves as my knee joint. So when I point my toes and my foot, my leg extends out. And when I flex my foot, my leg bends. So I walk by pointing and flexing my foot and I have my own knee joint that I am in control of. And as an amputee, that's huge because every joint you have that's your own makes for a better prosthetic fit and also allows you to have a better gait when you're walking. For sure. What was more difficult? Like, was it the adjusting to a prosthetic leg and the the rotation plasty or the actual cancer treatments themselves? Oh, that's a hard question. I think the rotation plasty leg, the prosthetic journey I've had in the last 25 years has probably been more ongoing. Mm -hmm. And in that, because of that, it's been more difficult. Um, You know, the cancer treatment, I mean, it's difficult and it's intense, but it was shorter term. You know, that was maybe a 13 month process for me where I was in my active protocol, whereas the prosthetic world, that's going to be my life forever. That never is going to change. Yeah, that's yeah, that's for sure. Surgeries often, you know, have long term um, effects, impacts on us, mm-hmm. and so yeah, I could totally see that. I once asked a person I was interviewing what was more difficult: um, adjusting to prosthetics. She lost both legs, or um, or recovering. She had um, a pain pill um, addiction after her surgery, and she actually said it was easier to adjust the prosthetics. And that was the first time I've ever heard that. It was always picked. Yeah, yeah. prosthetics are always mm-hmm. so difficult because the soreness, you know, finding the right fit, revisions. It's, yeah, I imagine mm-hmm. it's really difficult, so. It is, and it's probably outside of my cancer. The prosthetic aspect has been one of my greatest challenges. And being a, a mom, I have three little kids, so pregnancy posed a lot of struggles for me as you gain weight and your prosthetic doesn't fit properly and the alignment's off and after you have the baby, then your body kind of goes back to normal and it still doesn't fit like it did before. So, you know, as I've gone through adulthood, a lot of those struggles have come up, uh, dealing with chronic pain, having um, the prosthetic fit properly and finding people who understand rotation plasty well enough to know how to fit it to me. That's been my biggest struggle. Now, when you're you're dealing with your prosthetic, you know you're adapting to what it is now. Um, that started at a really young age, which was probably more beneficial than somebody having it, you know, at forty, uh, because you're young, you can adjust probably mm-hmm. better. But still, you know, there's difficulties in that in that process, like we we're saying, with revisions and so forth. Now, do you get involved in uh, in any sports? Are you are you going after anything, or is it just too difficult right now? You know, athletics were never my thing. I was—I always was in softball, and that's ironically how I was 
really diagnosed was because I was limping around the softball field. And then my goal after treatment was to make it back to the softball field the following year. And I met that goal. And I played a couple summers after that as well with my friends. But I was really the kid playing athletics for the social aspect. You know, I was more excited about whose mom brought snacks? What did you guys bring than winning the game or being the the star on the team? So I had a lot of fun with athletics growing up, but as I got older, I phased out of it and it just hasn't been as much of a driving force for me as it is for a lot of kids. So when you had, so, you, so go back to the kid state, that period of time, you're going through like if, through so much first cancer and cancer alone's enough. And you add in, now we're going to adapt to um, having to deal with life with uh, one less limb and how much were you, did you feel like you were included in life after that? Did you feel left out? Where were you in this period, you know, with your peers, especially? I was so lucky to have great support from our community. The moment I was diagnosed, we had my family's friends. We had teachers at school, kids at school, our church group, the whole community really rallied around us and gave us the support that we needed bringing meals by to the house because my parents and I were in the hospital a lot. Every little thing that they did made such an impact. And knowing that they still remembered me, you know, you're, you're kind of out of the loop with your friends for a long time when you're going through treatment. So to get cards or have people come visit you and send you things really helped you feel like, okay, you know, I, I have the energy to keep fighting. I'm going to get back to them and we're going to get back to where we were. But after treatment, going back to school was also really challenging. And I didn't really have anybody else to follow through that process. You know, nobody really knew how that was going to go. And trying to reacclimate with my classmates when I've been really around nurses and my family for over a year, I'm in an adult world in the medical world. And that's all I knew. And then you go back to class and you don't have as much in common with your classmates as you used to, because a lot of that innocence is gone. You've seen the dark sides of the world and what's out there in life. And that was harder than I had expected. You know, I always had a really positive attitude, but there were struggles along the way. You know, you, a lot of kids look forward to gym class when it's time to play a certain game like dodgeball. Well, running for me was really hard. So I would get nervous and anxious and embarrassed thinking, oh, God, I'm going to have to run. Like, I don't want to have to do this in front of everybody. Or the mile, when you'd run the mile in elementary school, I you know, would just dread those things. So going through that as a kid was really hard because you just want to blend in. You want to be like everybody else. And those were the limitations I realized I'm not like everybody else. And those moments reminded me of that. No, luckily as an adult, you're not forced to run a mile unless you really choose to. So, you know, those things have become far and few between as an adult. But as a kid, that was a really hard time for me. Yeah, the mile sucks for everybody, whether you went through something yeah. or it was awful. I know. I hated it before and I really hated it even more after. <laughs> yeah, I had this Russian gym teacher and she would just, uh, I'm not being mean about Russian. She was just really rigid <laughs> and tough and she'd like throw a ball at us as we'd run it. It was almost like a really good movie scene, you know, where yeah, you have to like jump over. Yeah, can picture it. Yeah, it's like it, it was totally, it was the mile sucked either way. And so, um, yeah, adjusting to life, you know, being with your peers, dating, doing that type of stuff must have felt weird when you you just went through, like you said, you saw the dark side. Life doesn't always continue. Life does change quick. Shit doesn't work out. Things aren't perfect. It just happens. And you saw it at such a young age. And to go back and be like, uh, be interested probably wasn't easy that would have you know that would have been really tough i don't know mm -hmm. it was really hard and you know and it was only a year or so between a year or two after my remission that my mentor through treatment i had met a, a, the most amazing person scott carter when i was first diagnosed and he was about three months ahead of me in his diagnosis he had osteosarcoma just like me he had rotation plasty we had the same protocol for chemotherapy and he was my mentor. He guided the way for me because he was just a little bit further ahead. And he had such a kind soul that he would always tell me what to expect coming up. And it wasn't always good. He'd tell me the bad. He'd tell me the good. And I felt such a sense of relief knowing what was coming. 
And it gave me a sense of control, even though I was totally out of control with most things in my life at that point. But knowing what to expect gave me a lot of relief. And so I credit a lot of my positivity through my journey to Scott because he helped give me the peace of mind that I needed. And after my remission, I had finished up treatment and Scott was going through relapse after relapse. And here I am 10 years old and my best friend dies of cancer. He battled it for over three years and lost his battle. And so going back to school and trying to focus on your schoolwork and trying to talk and connect with your friends when they're talking about really minor things and your friend just died, it, it was really tough. And you go to their funeral of, of a child and, you know, you never forget that because it's a life that was not completely lived. And he lived as fully as you ever could live 13 years, but it just seems so unfair that such a bright light was taken away. Um, so, you know, there's, there's never, there's just some things you must endure in life. You don't always have the answers, but you wake up and you do the best that you can. And I've really used Scott as a driving force in my life because he helped me so un, unselfishly. And I don't take for granted this life that I have been given and the fact that I survived cancer. You know, and I overcame this deadly disease and I've watched my friends die from that very same disease. So I feel compelled to live for them as well as for myself. Wow. Um, yeah. I I I watched a friend, a neighbor, I knew my whole life. He he did he had uh muscular dystrophy and uh, I think a few other things were going on too over time. And he went from uh, being able to run and play with us and slowly over time, um, it took its toll. And eventually he ended up um, passing away. And I remember that. I remember walking from school to his funeral at the church. It was a Catholic church and going in and watching his, his siblings play while the service was going on because they were so young. And then going back mm-hmm. to school, and there was, I think, four of us from the school that went. Because by the time he passed, he had already been out of school for so many years. And mm-hmm. it was just really difficult to absorb in society. But I've always had uh, difficulty absorbing in the normal way, you know, in and, and, and that realm. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, when you see a lot of reality and how difficult it can get, um, it's very, it's it's just hard. But that's, that's an amazing mm-hmm. story about your friend and that sucks you went through it i'm glad you came out and you're able to talk about it though it probably is huge Mm -hmm. to hear from you um for folks to hear from you and hear your your story regarding that now um we've already kind of hit this angle but going towards more of that how did you get through it how did you um survive those difficult moments and how do you help others do it cuz it does seem like it's your mission you are a mom too of course you're a parent and that takes up mm-hmm. a huge amount of time but this part of you that's been a part of you since you were 9 basically your whole life um is is so huge and i think about setbacks and especially when you're dealing with the body there seems to be a lot of setbacks. I hear stories almost daily of setbacks. What kind of setbacks did you encounter or a specific setback and how did you handle it? One of my greatest setbacks happened or started about five years ago when I had a prosthesis made that didn't have the right alignment. It was somebody making the prosthesis who didn't have much experience with rotation plasty And the alignment was off and my ankle joint, which was serving as my knee joint, was hyperextended. Mm -hmm. Every time I bared weight or I walked, this joint was put under a lot of stress. And I used that prosthesis for three years. So I did a lot of damage to my body in that time, not knowing what to do. I knew something wasn't quite right. I knew I shouldn't be in pain. But I also was really scared to know who else do I go to for help? You know, I didn't know who to trust to make my next prosthesis. It's a really challenging process having a a leg made. And I don't enjoy it even when it goes well. But when it doesn't go well, it made me even more apprehensive. So I was really frozen with that fear for a while, not knowing what to do, just kind of I was stagnant. And 
I had a, just a moment where I realized this isn't going to get better unless I do something because I'm not good now. I, I want to get better, but doing nothing's not the answer. So I started getting myself motivated to do something. I would get on the computer and research different people that might know how to do rotation plasty prosthetics better. And I followed up on a lot of those with phone calls or looking at their websites, trying to figure out the right place to go. And I found the right place. I now travel all the way to New York for my prosthetics. It's a group called A Step Ahead Prosthetics. And uh, Eric Schaefer makes my legs there. And he has more experience with, with rotation plasty than anyone I know. And he's an innovator. And he really custom makes my prosthetic. And it's gotten me out of pain, but it's been a long road. You know, you don't, you don't abuse your body in that joint for three years on one that's not fitting right and just get a good one that fits right. And it's instantly gone. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes months and it took me probably a good six months to get to a place that I wasn't in daily pain after I had the, a good prosthetic fit. And, um, it was shortly after that I decided, okay, I feel, I feel good now. I, you know, I really, we really wanted to have a third child and I thought it was out of the cards for me because I was in chronic pain before all of that. And I thought this isn't fair to bring a, another child into this if I'm struggling with this pain. Um, but when I got out of pain, I thought, okay, now's the time. And so we got pregnant with our daughter, who's now two. And about halfway through my pregnancy with her, that chronic pain came back because I'm bearing weight differently. And, you know, a lot of the struggles came back with the fit not being just right. So I struggled through that pregnancy, but I knew once I got through that and the baby was born, I could, you know, get back to New York and I'd have a new one made where we could get the fit where it needed to be again and it would fit well. So I, I just had to persevere and hold on to hope that it can and it will get better. And when it's a long-term fight like that, you know, sometimes you question whether it's really going to get better. You know, you just, you don't know, but I think you have to hold on to that hope that it will and keep pushing forward. Totally. Yeah. That mindset of um, first going through the almost a grieving process, the depression, the anxiety, the fear of what could happen next. What if this doesn't work out, then what? Mm -hmm. And then adapting to that, figuring out how to, to no matter the outcome, you got to figure out a way to keep going. And so mm -hmm, absolutely. what I, another thing I had on my questions that I didn't get to ask you earlier is um, dealing with uh, pediatric cancer, especially um, St. Baldrick's, for instance, I've, I've talked with those folks and I've interviewed and, um, you know, a child and a caretaker that went through that process. And one of the mm -hmm. most, yeah, one of the most frustrating things they seem to um, exp express is like, uh, Hey, there's not enough treatments out there for pediatric patients. And, uh, for mm -hmm. your experience, what was the most frustrating thing, um, when it came to how, how your case was handled and what's the solution? When I was going through treatment, we had a lot of hope. This was 1991, and the doctors that I was that I was working with said, you know, we we have osteosarcoma that we're studying in the lab. We're doing research on this, and they felt that a cure was within five years, that they would be finding a cure within five years. And I remember asking my doctor and my surgeon. I said, well, can we just wait then? Because then I don't have to lose my leg. I'll just <laughs> yeah, wait. Yeah. He's like, no, we can't wait. You know, we still need to do this and we need to be aggressive so that you can move on from this. I was like, okay, I had to ask. But, um, you know, I always thought, well, this is great. You know, kids aren't going to have to go through this forever. But here we are 25 years later and we're really no closer to a cure for a lot of these pediatric cancers. And the biggest problem is, is the research. Pediatric cancer gets 4% of the national cancer research funding. So kids get just basically the crumbs of what's left over for cancer research. There are very few, less than a handful of drugs that are designed for kids. And I think finding organizations to either be a part of or to donate to that help with the research aspect of pediatric cancer is really important because raising awareness is great and, you know, supporting kids and families, that's great too, but they really need a cure. They need better treatments. They need a cure. And finding organizations that put their money behind research funding, that's how we find a cure. 
Wow. And how do you, you seem passionate about it. Is this your passion? Is this what you think you were set up to do besides being a mom? Of course, that's very, very important. That's not just not a besides. Okay. How did you yes. settle in and chase it? Or was it just natural? It was natural. I, I started mentoring other kids who were going through cancer treatment while I was still going through treatment. And Scott, my mentor, is really the reason why I did that because I understood the value of that support of someone who knows exactly what you're going through. Someone who's been through it, someone that's going through it is such an amazing asset when you're struggling. To know that you're not alone gives you a lot of hope. And knowing how much that impacted my life, I wanted to do the same thing for others. And mentoring others really saved me because it gave me a new profound purpose outside of who I was before cancer. And that is something that has just been a fire in my belly ever since. I, it's never gone away. It's almost fueled up more because it makes me frustrated that I'm still here 25 years later hearing stories about kids going through the same thing I went through. And their treatments are virtually the same. You know, they're still taking limbs. They're still doing the same chemo protocols. Not a lot has changed in over two decades. And I don't think that's good enough. I think we can do better for our kids. Yeah, it seems like it's super underfunded, especially on the pediatric mm -hmm. side. And then a promise of, say, stem cells just hasn't come to fruition yet. It's frustrating for sure because there's a lot of promise. And um, being in academia at one point in my life, it seemed like to get published – and to get funding, it often required sensationalizing, and um, that's what I noticed in a lot of a lot of research. And on that side too, the promise the promise is made. If if we have this funding, we can do this, and that's true. You need funding to go, but it also builds a lot of hope that might not be right around the corner. Super frustrating, mm -hmm. super frustrating. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with um anxiety? Anxiety that um. Do you fear like the future, how, how you go forward? Do you fear how you're going to be able to handle aging, anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely have fears. I have had fears about reoccurrence since my diagnosis and since my remission. That really doesn't change or ever go away. But how I handle it is I really I start by reassuring myself that worrying is not going to help. And it's also not going to change the outcome. So a lot of how I handle it is I ask myself what I'm afraid of and I talk myself through my fears. So I really stare my fears in the face and I realize what is within my control here and what is not in my control. And if I can change something and I can make something better, I do it and I pursue it until it's better. And if I can't change it, I have to let it go. And that's something that's come up in my life constantly. It's not something that I think we as humans conquer. I think it's a process that we have to learn how to cope with those fears and learn what alleviates that and what helps us and then let go of what you can't control. And you just kind of repeat that every time those fears start to bubble up to the surface, you do the same thing. Now, if you, you've been through a ton, I, I for like a, you've been through so much. If you had like a, let's say like a venue or or maybe you have you have the ability to place an ad on a major news site and it goes everywhere. You can say anything in that ad, maybe brief, maybe a paragraph, but something to say um, regarding life after all you've been through. Um, maybe it's direction, instruction, or what you've learned. Um, what would it be? Oh, gosh. I feel like the core of me and my mission or my statement to the world would be the value of connection with other people that we're not meant to do it alone. We're meant to support each other and we're meant to ask for help and we're meant to help others. And also that we're all different and that's okay, but we can still work together for the common good of all of us and as an amputee, you know, I think we're all different, but as an amputee, my difference or what makes me different is very obvious. You know, if I'm wearing shorts, people can see what makes me different. And, you know, when I get stared at, if I'm out in public with shorts on, I just think, 
wow, like what makes me unique or what makes me different is so obvious to the outside world, but something that makes them different might be a little more concealed. And, you know, like you said, if you struggle with depression or you struggle with anxiety, you know, there's also a lot of diseases that are within and part of being an amputee that maybe has worked to my advantage is that because it's so outward and it's so obvious, it has forced me to work on it within myself because it's in the forefront. And I think as much as that's been a pain in my rear going through my life, I think it's probably helped me a lot too because it's forced me to look into these things. What does it take? What did it take for you to gain self-acceptance? Oh, that's a tough one. I think it's a process, definitely. I think I looked at my story with cancer and as an amputee, probably more so in my teen years. And as you're growing up, I, I saw it more as a weakness or, oh, I'm going to have to you know, overcome these things. And as I've become an adult, I've really embraced it as being my superpower. You know, it's what makes me different. It's what makes me unique and special. And, you know, I love that part. And I don't know that I would give that up for anything because I fully embraced who I am and it's created what I stand for. And I think whether it's cancer or it's something else, those struggles unite us and we can all be very connected through those challenges in our life. Yeah. It's like, there's the, it's almost black and white at times. There is the gray, but there is like a black and white where you're finally like, you, you, you think I'm overcoming something. I got to hide it. I got to wear this. I got to do that. And, um, eventually there's a part for some people that get to that place where they can say, no, actually it's a really cool story and I'm actually doing something mm -hmm. that matters. And at least in my life, it matters. And it's a big deal. And, um, if there's judgments that I don't like, who cares? I mean, there's, there's really, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a really, I don't know. There's, there's, I've gone through it where you finally just accept it and, but you accept it, not just accepting it, but you kind of take the ball and run. And yeah, I think that's a really totally positive. Embrace it. Yeah, it's a positive experience when you can go out there and just who cares, you know, and mm -hmm. um, be a part of it. I'd rather have the uh, physical side though than the mental side. You know, the mental side can torture you for a long time and be much it more can, brutal. It can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for a long time, you know, I I didn't mind the stares that I would get from people when I was a kid. You know, and then you hit those teen years. I'm like, I don't like being stared at. I'm sick of this. You know, it's been years of going out in public in shorts and, you know, you get these looks from people like, Oh my God, what, what's wrong with her leg? And, you know, kids come up to you and, and they're usually pretty darn innocent and like, what happened to your leg? But, you know, it's amazing how many grown adults will just mouth open, eyes wide, just eyes locked on my leg as I walk by. And, you know, I just look at them and say, hi, you know, yeah, so you what I'm thinking in my head, but a lot of that actually, when I was a teenager, drove me to wear longer dresses, to wear pants. You know, it'd be 90 degrees outside and I would wear jeans because I just didn't want to deal with the stairs. Totally. And the problem with that was the more that I concealed myself to make someone else comfortable, the more anxiety it created within myself to now upkeep this secret. You know, and I feel so much more comfortable just wearing shorts and, you know, feeling more comfortable physically, but also letting myself be free. You know, it's just freed a lot of anxiety for me. And honestly, my best of cancer platform has helped me embrace that even more because I realized, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are in a similar situation. And, you know, if I have a prosthesis and I can go out there and walk around, then some other little girl five years from now, it may not be so odd to the world because they've seen me out there. And if we all do that, maybe the world will embrace differences better. Yeah, I think uh, what's really helped in that realm, especially with limb loss, is that we have a whole generation, unfortunately, a big generation of soldiers coming back and they're just they're just sporting it. They're just throwing it out there. They love it. Mm -hmm. They yeah, they design their prosthetics and they put something on them, you know, like flames. I don't know. They go crazy with it. And then they run these crazy races yeah. and don't give a shit. They don't care. And uh mm -hmm. they're they're actually really excited about it. They have something to prove or something. You know, it's pretty it's pretty impressive. And and there's a message that goes with it too about acceptance, acceptance of the bad stuff that will happen and then running with it. 
Um, it's, it's mm-hmm. really cool. And like you said, your, your community, your presence that you're there, it's a way of gaining self acceptance and also helping others to gain that, to gain a perspective. But you gained it so young. I can't, um, you know, with that, I don't know, there's that existential crisis that you went through. It's so young and having a best friend, a mentor suffering from the same, um, or, you know, going through the same situation and not making it. That's, pretty incredible do you go through the why mm-hmm. me's do you do that you know i never did i've never been one to say why me i almost as a kid i had a i had kind of a weird perspective as a kid you know the older i get the more i realize that wasn't normal my mindset because i was so positive and very focused on what i was trying to accomplish but i would think to myself why not me i'm no better than the next person yeah. so does, is there a person that deserves this, you know, I don't really think so. So, you know, you could say, why me? Or you could say, why not me? And I'm just going to do the best I can to overcome it. Do the kids get what you've uh, overcome? I like you use the term cancer thriver, like our last person we interviewed, Rhonda Ramsey. And do Mm -hmm. your kids understand all all you've gone through your kids? Yeah, I talked to them about it. You know, we're very open about my experience. And I, you know, I talked to them about things that I'm discussing on my blog, Best of Cancer. And, you know, my oldest, especially, he really, he gets it more. He's eight years old. And he's so proud of me. You know, he's so, so excited. And, you know, he, he's always like, I love your leg, mom. I wish I had a leg like you. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. just, it warms my heart to see him embrace that part of me, you know, and at such a young age you know, that he, he gets it. And I use it as a launching pad, honestly, for my kids to teach them that we're all different and it's okay. You know, you can use this as your gift. You know, the way that you're different is special. We're not all supposed to be the same. You know, we all pretend to be like we're all the same when we're younger, but you know, as you get older, you realize that you've got to embrace those differences because, you know, they're really what make you unique. I find that people that have gone through a lot of stuff, tend to have a uh, a good sense of humor about things. Like for me, I'm pretty serious on this yeah. podcast, but I have a horribly dark uh, sense <laughs> of humor and nothing, I can't take much serious on myself. You know, others I take very uh-huh. serious what they're going through, but myself, I have a hard time taking myself serious. And But it, it does make for funny moments. Do you find your household mm-hmm. having a lot of that too? Yeah, I think you have to laugh at yourself when you start getting too serious or when things are really crummy, it's like, well, you either can laugh about it so, or you're going to cry about it. So having a sense of humor has been a huge lifesaver for me when I was going through cancer and then even all the after stuff. You, know, you have to laugh about it or else you just be too darn depressed about it. And you know, we did that even as as a kid in the hospital with cancer. You know, my My best friend, Scott, he would always take a can of silly string every time he was checked into the hospital for inpatient chemo and he would halfway through his chemo dose, he'd push the nurse button and, and tell him, Oh, I don't feel very good. Can you, someone needs to come in here right away. And the nurse would come in and he would just smother them in silly string. And they're like, we thought you were sick. You know, we'd laugh or, you know, you have, you have syringes full of water. So you have water fights with syringes, you know, medical places have a lot of really fun, Toys My God! For kids and yeah, a water fight with syringes. Turning everything into a water gun. Yeah, so I wouldn't expect that in a hospital. Maybe like Santa Cruz, California, where there's a lot of discarded, <laughs> syri- but by, by the beach. But yeah, but yeah, not, these are clean syringes. Yeah, let no, me rephrase that. No, 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 totally. I, yeah, no, that's great. I, I would love to participate in that. That that's hilarious, actually. <laughs> that's great. No, yeah. okay. So life, life's life's taught you a ton of stuff. And we're gonna have listeners that are going through the bad stuff. Um, is mm-hmm. there is there a you know you do, you have leaned on this a bunch. You have a message. You know, uh, um, is there any final thoughts you want to leave with those that you know maybe going through something pretty tough like pediatric cancer right now? Because we will have listeners that are probably going through that. You know, they're gonna find this. They're gonna stumble across this podcast episode and be like, "Hey, what's she got to say about it?" When I'm dealing with this right now. Mm-hmm. I would tell them to never give up and hold on to hope that little by little we can choose to be happy and we can choose to make the best of a negative situation, not only cancer, but any struggle. And, you know, I figure if you're going to have to go through something tough, you might as well choose to make the best of it. 
you have to go through this crap anyway. You might as well do it with a positive attitude and laugh along the way. That's great. That really is great. That's a that's a great message. Um, and I think that your story, you continuing to share it and sharing, you know, um, the perspectives of losing people that have gone through the process is pretty incredible. It's very difficult to watch others um, not mm -hmm. make it. And, and yeah. you now having this chance to share how to make, you know, what happens after you make it and what you can do with it is really cool. Now, if I were going to reach you, if I were going to reach out to you, is it Instagram? It seems like you've turned everything to social media instead of a website, which a lot of people are doing. What's the best way to get in touch with you? The best way to get in touch with me is on Best of Cancer on Instagram and Facebook. I also have www.bestofcancer.com, which links content from my Facebook page. Nice. Yeah, I'm on your page. Your Instagram is very valuable too. You have um, the story section where questions can pop up and you'll add them to there. And that's great. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's pretty interactive. And it's good to see that. It's good to see the, the give and take. And it's good to see the, your system in play. You do have a system. That's why we have you on here is because you do have a system that worked because you're here and you're helping others and you've adapted to some pretty significant challenges. And so hopefully people can take a piece of that system, apply it to themselves, cancer or no cancer, whatever you're going through, there's mm -hmm. a message there. So hopefully they get that. And we really appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, putting yourself out there. Keep doing it. Oh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. To wrap this all up, thanks to Jill England. And if you want to find Jill England, look in the show notes. There are links to her social media accounts and they should be clickable. It really is that simple. And as you know, you can always find more about Living Adaptive at livingadaptive.com. Peace.